So one thing is clear, Yale does have the brightest lights. <laughs> so are we in the soup is the title of the talk. Let's start with competitive systems which are omnipresent in the modern world. We are competing everywhere. In the in the financial markets, in the business world, we have competition in academia, in the media. Everywhere people are competing with each other, and economists tell us that these are very efficient systems that on the one hand elicit the best efforts of people, and on the other hand also create an optimal distribution of roles, where the division of labor is optimally op organized, where people are assigned to the roles that work best for them. The competitive systems have a, a vulnerable underbelly. There's a big problem, an Achilles heel of competitive systems, and that is that they, uh, there are two ways of getting ahead in a competitive system. One is you do what the system rewards and you do it better than everybody else. The other way of doing it is you try to corrupt in some way the rules of the system, try to influence them, or the application of those rules. You lobby, for example. And that is really a way in which these competitive systems can become much less efficient in that these, on the one hand, resources invested in trying to reshape the rules of the game, trying to get ahead by changing the rules, changing the application, are resources that are taken away from socially valuable purposes. And secondly, of course, insofar as these efforts to corrupt, to subvert the rules of the competition work, they will uh, undermine the tracking of the system. The system will no longer work as well in achieving the socially valuable purposes such as justice, learning, innovation, whatever we want the system to achieve. So one thing that will easily happen then is that we get an inequality spiral. Strong players in a competitive system are more able to influence the rules. They're more able to invest resources in trying to redesign, reshape the rules to lobby. And they will do that, of course, in order to shape the rules in such a way that they themselves will be advantaged by the new ways the rules are shaped and thereby capture an increasing share of, what the, of the rewards that the system makes available. Uh, the strongest participants have that advantage. They will thereby increase their share of the social product. They will become more able to lobby, more able to uh, convert resources into rule changes, capturing an even greater share of the social product. And so you get an inequality spiral, runaway inequality in the system. Now, the US government is a particularly soft target for this sort of lobbying for a variety of reasons that have to do with Supreme Court decisions, campaign contributions, super PACs, and so on. It's pretty easy to influence the US government if you invest money in it. And again, strong players are more able to organize themselves to do that. They have more resources, and they can also more easily form alliances, acquire the requisite expertise, and so on. So the US government is a prime target. We all know that from domestic politics, but what is perhaps less obvious is that also in supranational rule shaping, uh, the US government is a very lucrative target to invest lobbying resources in. There are especially high returns from lobbying US government officials for four reasons. The US government in international negotiations is generally the strongest party. There's no democratic counterweight at the international level that kind of stops the uh, exercise of strong power and influence of the strongest governments. There's little transparency. Often we can't find out uh, what sort of rules are being negotiated. Even exposed, it's often very unclear who argued for what language in international agreements and so on. And finally, uh, there is very little moral restraint because people can always say that uh, we don't uh, feel obliged to abide by moral restraints because we have no assurance that other parties, nowadays favorably the Chinese, will abide by similar moral restraints. So there is a huge focus now on lobbying uh, major governments, especially the United States, with regard to international agreements. So the most cost-effective lobbying that you can now invest money in if you're very rich is lobbying that has as its object the design of supranational uh, institutions that tries to shift 
regulation upward from the national level to the global level, because that's where lobbying can more cost effectively be conducted. That is done by the very richest participants, sometimes individually, sometimes in alliance with each other. And that influences government officials, in particular the government of the United States, because of its special power and its greater vulnerability to lobbying than other governments. You can see here the effect of this. This is a sixth of a century, a very short period of time, 17 years, 1988 to 2005. And you can see how the global income distribution has shifted during that period. It's a very dramatic shift. It doesn't look that dramatic here. But look in particular at the left bottom corner where you see the bottom quarter of the human population losing about one third of its share of global household income. It's a tremendous shift in household income in favor of the top 5%. They're the only ones who gained, everybody else lost, and the bottom quarter lost the most, at least in relative terms. I'll show it to you one more time. A tremendous shift, and this is just one sixth of a century. If these trends continue, you can imagine what the world's income distribution will look like 50 or 100 years from now. Now, the consequences for the poor are again obvious. These are the numbers of people who are chronically undernourished, and you can see that this number has been going up pretty consistently since 1996. I've put that number in red because that was the year in which the world's governments promised in Rome that they would half that number by 2015. Later, that promise was diluted as the so-called Millennium Development Goal number one. But the original version of the promise was that we will halve the number of chronically undernourished people by 2015. As you can see, the number walked off in the opposite direction and never looked back. Now, can the spiral be slowed or stopped? Well, we hope so. There are lots of people, morally motivated people, working in the developing world, millions of them, trying to help poor people protect them from the headwind that global institutional arrangements are blowing into their faces. But often, what 10,000 people do in a developing country is brought to naught by a stroke of a pen, if you like, in the headquarters where these trade agreements are being negotiated. Often, the damage done by one sentence in an international trade agreement outweighs the efforts of 10,000 people in the developing world. So morality is, in a way, a very weak force. And what we need to do is think not only about how we can, as individuals, protect poor people, but also what we can do at the structural level to try, if possible, to slow that headwind or to turn it off. Now, one nice idea is to create a widely shared commitment to justice so that all the people who are involved in rule design at the international level will voluntarily refrain from pressing their advantage to the point where the poor are getting hurt, where justice is clearly not being done. But this sort of idea has little prospect in the world as we have it for three reasons. One is the payoffs of corrupting the system are so enormously large. And so the temptations to cheat, the temptations uh, to shift the rules even in unjust ways are overwhelming. Secondly, there are, this is known, so there is an assurance problem. Players say, why should I restrain myself if I don't have assurances that Chinese companies, once again, or others will play by the same rules? It's very difficult also to monitor compliance. It's very difficult to check whether other large corporations or industry associations or banks are abiding by these same constraints in their lobbying. And finally, this moralization of certain rules is itself subject to manipulation. So sometimes big corporations are trying to manipulate us into moralizing certain rules, thinking of these rules as moral rules, for example, intellectual property rights which were pressed upon the world with the language of theft and piracy and so on and so forth. Now, what I think we can do as morally motivated agents trying to protect the poor better in the system of runaway inequality is to think more carefully about the prudential incentives that players have and about how we can collaborate with other agents, more powerful agents, in ways that doesn't require them to be morally motivated but appeals to their prudential motivations. The first thing to notice here is that wealthy individuals and corporations are much more interested in their relative than in their absolute position. And so if we can think of systemic changes that will benefit or 
cost them roughly equally, doesn't change their relative position, but only slightly lowers their absolute position, uh, that's a pretty good way uh, to get ahead. Another thought is that the international system as we have it, because it allows very powerful agents to buy particular slices of the rule pudding, tends towards incoherence, instability, efficiency. So it's quite possible that even very powerful agents, as the global financial crisis has shown, might do better if they had a little bit less influence on global rule shaping than they have now. Because a more coherent system would result that would deliver better benefits, not only for the poor, but also for the rich. Thirdly, the interests of powerful agents often diverge, and here it would be important, I think, to work with some powerful agents, maybe insurance companies against the pharmaceutical industry or whatever. There are alliances that we can form where morally motivated agents, though too weak alone to shift the balance, can, in conjunction with prudentially motivated allies, make a difference. And finally, there are principal agent problems, which are uh, the divergence between the interests of a corporation, which are often very long-term, and the interests of those who lead a corporation, which are often more short-term, where reform programs can be motivated by front-loading their benefits and back-loading their costs in such a way that leaders, corporate leaders, have an incentive to agree to them, even if they are not, strictly speaking, in the long-term interest of the corporation. So these are four thoughts uh, that may be helpful in trying to stem this dreadful tendency towards runaway inequality in the world. And my conclusion is then basically that my generation has failed pretty spectacularly in protecting the poor. We've had 30 years of runaway inequality where the share of global income of the poor has been shrinking consistently. And as a result, inequality has become very entrenched and reform has become ever harder to achieve because the power distribution has, of course, also shifted. What we need to do to achieve real participation by the poor is to mobilize, of course, morally motivated action, but conjoin it with prudential, prudentially motivated allies in order to try to work for systemic change. Thank you very much.